How's it sound? Everything sounds good. Groovy. Daniel O'Connor. Danny O'Connor. Do you go by Danny or Daniel or I Dan? I go by what the fuck ever, man. They have, my nickname comes up all the time. I get called Irish Johnny. People don't know my real name. Johnny. Yeah, I always call you Johnny. <laughs> like, I always think of Johnny Irish. You had that cool, you had the fucking, uh, one of the coolest banners from the, back in. The Snatch Banner. Yeah. I get, I get asked about that a lot. That was a, that was a, that was a drunken idea. Yeah. All my ideas come when I'm lit up. So yeah, I watched the. I was looking up Snatch the movie and uh, saw that picture and I was like, that'd be a cool fucking like to redo. Dude, that's one of the best fucking movies. Yes. Who did that guy, Richie? Yes. He makes fantastic movies. And uh, you got the guy that just fought freaking uh, Wilder, who was basically the guy that um, Brad Pitt portrayed, it's freaking uh, Pikey. Oh really? He's a gypsy. He goes around. He did go went around bare knuckle boxing. Oh. Um, Tyson. Tyson Fury. Yeah, Tyson Fury. He was a he's the gypsy king. That's why I call him that. He used to go around bare knuckle boxing throughout Europe. I did not know that. <laughs> I don't know anything about him. I really should listen to his podcast on Rogan. Um, a lot of people said it was really good. I didn't even hear it, but I knew a lot about the guy because of that. Oh really? You did. When, I, when he started coming up, and I was like, oh man, he sounds like the guy off of Snatch, and then sure shit, he fucking. He basically was. Was, was the dude off of, off of uh, Snatch. That's dope. That's fucking dope, dude. Um, man, dude. So let's uh, let's talk about your recent fight because for the folks who don't know, you have been in the game for a long time. About 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, I think it was like nine years. I think I fought whenever I stopped. So I know I think you started right about nine years. It'll be ten years in January. Yeah, and say I think you you we were starting right at the same time. You started a little bit before me, Something but like either way, dude, it's been a long ass fucking road. Yeah, it has. A lot, lot, a lot has changed. It is, and that's a lot of change, and it's adapted so much. So that's kind of got to the point where being tough and uh, being tough wasn't going to cut it anymore. <laughs> no, dude, it, it only that shit would only take you so far. And that's how far it took me. I was 36 years old. I had a year set. I was 35. So, I man, I watched people go past their prime that were coaches of mine and friends of mine that would go past their prime trying to still fight. Yeah. And I was like, man, I got to I gotta make a year to cut it off. And I cut it off at 35, but I, was like, I, I couldn't go out on a loss because I was uh, I was in those camps, last few camps, worked on the east side. I was during camp. I usually didn't party and stuff, but – it kind of progressed a little bit, and I was doing, I was drinking too much and partying too much during camps, and I had to. Yeah. I, like, I got to do one where I'm not drinking at all during camp and going out and shit. So. Yeah. <laughs> so this is my last one, and it was a. Uh, I was gonna. I didn't know if I was gonna do it or not, but for the cause. Yeah, you had good reason. Yeah, right? you know, for guns and hoses and backstoppers. My cousin was a recipient of it. That way I couldn't turn it down, so I had to. Had to take one more. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. It's, that one is definitely, um, I mean, that's a fight that's a lot bigger than yourself, right? It's, Correct. It, that's an easy one to get up for. So yeah. For the folks listening, though, and I would actually, actually, I want to know more about it because, um, I, dude, I um, I don't consume a lot of news. Mm -hmm. And um, I even consume less on Facebook now. So, like, obviously, I'm aware of, like, what happened to your cousin. But like I don't know all the details or anything like that. Not that you need to give me all the details, but like give me the rundown. Like what? Give me yeah. Like tell tell me about your cousin. What happened? You know why you're fighting and, and all that good stuff. For him. As a matter of fact, I think it was a year ago tomorrow. Um, I was actually uh, my buddy um, Michael uh, oh, Mike Fowler was in town. I was taking him out to eat. I got a phone call from my dad that said uh, my cousin Ryan had got shot. He's an Arnold police officer. He was um, transporting a guy to jail and the other officers I guess missed the gun that he had hidden he had two guns on him they missed one of the guns and uh d while he was pulling in the police station on a police station the guy pulled the gun out shot my cousin back of the head straight through his brain and stopped his eye socket <clears throat> 40 caliber and uh they didn't expect him to live so that's like the worst phone call you could get that's the one is being a son of a cop brother of a cop grandson cousin nephew of a cop you're all of those yeah i'm all of those that's what you're always worried about that's your biggest fear growing up <clears throat> uh and that's the phone call we got that day and i was eating sushi with mike fowler and i was t trying to explain to him and he was like looking at me like is this your life this is kind of this is the shit that happens in my life and uh 
it, he was uh there wasn't sure to make it and long story short he uh he ended up making it and he's doing a thousand times better than anybody thought he was gonna do um he's still not 100 percent they don't know if he'll be 100 percent i think he will because we just have some weird dna in our family that we're just tough and go beyond what people think we can pull off. You guys off. are all fucking fighters. Yeah, and that's basically it. Our gran- my, our grandpa was a professional wrestler, professional boxer. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He was a giant guy. I got screwed on the height weight. <laughs> <laughs> he was 6'6", six, six, and I'm 5'3". <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's just tough. And he uh, he's coming along. And he's doing fantastic. So when this opportunity came, because I've been trying to raise money as much as I can to help out, because there's only certain things I can do to help people out. And this is something where I can use my, I guess, uh, semi-fame or whatever you want to call it to help out. Yeah. So I try and help people out as much as I possibly can in life. And this is a certain way that I could do that. So I've been trying to, I try to raise money in different ways to yeah. help in that situation. Well, dude, you're deeply embedded in this fucking St. Louis community. Like there's been times, you know, we've been, we've been at parties or whatnot, like, like Helm Fest or something and sitting there <laughs> talking and shit. Like you have all the best stories, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to fucking have you on. You are the craziest motherfucker I know <laughs> in the best possible way, yeah. like nine lives. But, um, but yeah, no, like you're just, uh, just pretty deeply like ingrained, like in this area. Um, I don't know where the fuck I was going with that. Oh, helping people. Um, so, I, dude, you've always killed it with like ticket sales and shit like that, yeah. and and being able to like get people together because like you know so many different types of groups in the fucking area. That's true. I uh, there are not some of the groups that you don't want to know, but <laughs> <laughs> working where I work and doing what I do, I was like, you meet everybody. Um, yeah, but those are the people that you want to know on the same yeah, at the same those time. People that have money that <laughs> throw money out there to buy tickets and. Want to be hot shots? Uh, it, it's weird. I never expected this uh, starting out. Yeah. And I, I knew I, I always knew that I had stage presence and uh, could definitely talk. So I would be able to bring people into whatever I did. Yeah. So that's why I did it the way I did it, and I try to help people out in the way I, the way I have, because that's what my mom always did, and kind of got ingrained in me of helping others. Yeah. So I try and do that. With, well, the t-shirt company that we started for a little bit to teach people how to make t-shirts and what to do. When did you do that? Uh, when I started out, I first made my when I first made the Johnny Iris t-shirts. When I started, I sold like two hundred of them. Dude, yeah, you are a beast. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you just got, you got to know how know what people like and know what to put on them. And I was trying to teach people how to do that. We made a t-shirt company with Jim Jenkins and uh, another guy, and we it was um custom fighter tees or some crap name i can't remember what the hell it was yeah but uh we're basically handed out t-shirts made t-shirts for their fighters and like hey give us 50 percent back well it ended up screwing us in the end but it was helping out other fighters and teaching them how to do what i did make quality t-shirts that are soft and comfortable yeah and don't make it with a stupid ass logo that nobody's gonna want or have your face just plastered on it yeah and show them what they want and uh you know i'm trying to help people out in different regards yeah, add a little business to yeah. it. Dude, so many people do not understand the business no. side of this. It's crazy. It blows me away. It's tough to make money and fight, and people don't understand that. Oh, yeah. I was like, I, I did the banners, and I did the T-shirts, and uh, I was looking at how other fighters made money, and I'd, I'd make a mental note of it, and like, okay, I'm going to do this this next fight, and I'm going to start trying to look for sponsors, look for uh, people, and then I'm going to use the T-shirts as a uh, – as a cuss, I'm not gonna make a lot of money off the t-shirts, but I can get if I get a sponsor to pay 500 bucks for a spot on the t-shirt. You know, you can still make like t-shirts cost like 20 bucks. You sell them for t-shirts cost like 10, 12 bucks. You sell them for 20. You make a little bit of money off of it, but yeah. you get the sponsor money off of that and the banners. Right, it's people, a one-one for everybody. Yeah, and and then you have the you sell your uh, after party. You know, people started doing that stuff. I don't know if I I don't think I started it. I wouldn't say I started it. But I definitely promoted it where people learned how to promote themselves and promote their business, which is your marketing name. Right. You need to promote yourself, and that's your business name right now. Well, you're you, a fighter. Yeah. Well, you realized it was something that needed to be done, that needed to be done, and nobody was doing it around here, at least. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't realize it for other people. I realized it for me to make, because I was trying to make more money. Yeah. And then I noticed that nobody else was doing it, and there were friends that weren't doing it. Yeah. And I was trying to f- tell them, I was like, this is what you need to do. And I would basically sit people down and tell them how to make more money fighting because as a fighter, you know, you start out, you make like 500 and 500. 
dude, my very first fight, I think it was like three and three. Yeah, it's it's junk. Three hundred bucks. Yeah, I didn't make if, any money. If mine was that, I, yeah. I, don't, I think mine was right yeah. around that. Yeah, my it's, dude. Yeah, I think I made after you pay for your license and yeah. whatever else, your blood work and all the other shit you got to pay for, like. I think I, I made like 300 bucks. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what I did is I figured out uh, when I started selling tickets and I started promoting and I was like trying to figure out different ways to do it. My first fight I made, I made a killing Yeah, because I was trying to figure out extra ways to make more money Yeah, because yeah. that was my job at that point in time. You were hustling. So I hustled. I learned how to, I mean, that's just the thing I grew up with was hustling. Yeah. Figure out how to make more money. And I did the t-shirts. I did the banner. I did the after party. I did all that. I think I walked with probably 10 times what most guys walk with in the first fight. Oh, yeah. So, and once they saw that, like, Jim Jenkins was probably the biggest guy that saw that and saw how much money I made. And he went, holy shit, <clears throat> why, don't you, why don't we do this t-shirt company and you show guys how to make money? Because the, these promoters are only going to pay you this amount of money. Yeah. So, I started doing that and started helping guys out and helping them promote each other. Like, guys weren't asking for, didn't know how to ask for sponsors. They're scared to go up and walk walk up to a business, knock on their door, and be like, hey, uh, hey, listen, I got this fight coming up on blah, blah, blah. It has this many people are going to be watching it. It's going to be nationally televised. They're not doing that. They're just sitting there. They're walking out, and they don't have, the other guy has a banner that has, like, 15 logos on it, and this guy is coming out with no banner, no T-shirts, and he's making basically what he shows up. And ticket sales. If he sold tickets, if it, if he doesn't know how to promote, he wasn't making money off of that either. Yeah, when you gotta, you have to put in the like the legwork to actually do that. Um, I know I was always guilty of like not actually wanting to do that. I would make T-shirts and sell them. I never really wanted to get sponsors. And a lot of guys, like you said, I think most of it for most people is like they just don't know how to do it. Yeah. I just didn't want to do it. But it it is like if you want to make money, like you have to you have to sell. Like I, in hindsight, I should have did that shit. But you know what I mean, like. You have to to one like put in the work and like you can't be afraid to to say some people will say no but I mean you can't be afraid to go ask yeah and that's what a lot of thing is because you sound like you're begging for money and it, it does seem like you don't want to go and ask for help you gotta sell it's it not, you gotta it's not asking for help it's giving them a business opportunity to make more money as well mm -hmm. you gotta look at it as that or it, yeah I don't want to go ask somebody for money. I go and tell them, hey, listen, here's our business opportunity. If you want it, take it. If you don't, don't. Yeah. Here's what here's what we can do. Um, I can either have you like for their after parties. I'd say, hey, listen, this is uh, after party costs seven hundred fifty bucks. I'm gonna bring everybody from my people from, from my show. I'm sold uh, two hundred fifty tickets uh, to your after party, and I, I'm guessing one hundred fifty will show. If you'd like to have the after party here, awesome. If not, I'll go to the guy next door and ask him if, if he wants it, and they'll go, okay, well, let's do it that way. And that's how you do it. It's yeah. not hard to pull off if you just know how to talk to people. Yeah, and you don't got to be a dick, right? You're just no. you're just like these are the facts. Yeah, these, you know what I mean. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. Yeah, you, you take it or leave it. Yeah. If you don't like it, then uh, they'll either say, "Hey, we'll we'll offer this amount of money." You can either say, "Okay, I'll take five hundred for the after party," or you can think if you can make more money on the after party, you go to the guy next door who's down the street and ask him for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then essentially, I mean, I mean, they want that business. Yeah, they're gonna make so much money. Once they saw the amount of people I actually brought in and the amount of money that was uh, being spent, most people didn't want to lose that business. Yeah. Because they would, I'd have guys that would come in that would uh, have bar tabs of, because my friends are heavy drinkers. So, <laughs> uh, they'd have, I'd have one person have a bar tab that would cover what they spent on me. Yeah. So they would go, okay, 500 bucks, let's say 500 bucks. And we'd have one guy that would spend 500 bucks. And they go, then that's, there's a hundred and, 149 other people that are also have bar tabs. Yeah. So it's a huge night for them. Right. So usually you don't have a bar that has 150 freaking people yeah, trying to if out anybody, drink everybody else. Just to get that many people alone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, shit, you should have more bargaining power than that. Yeah. I mean, I, I always always try to keep it in a reasonable amount of money for people so they wouldn't, uh, so they wouldn't look away from it or they wouldn't uh, feel like it was... Like they were being it was slighted. a risk. Yeah, like it was a risk. Oh, it yeah. was always it was always a reward. It wasn't ever a risk because five hundred bucks to a bar is nothing. Yeah, especially when you have one guy that can cover it. And that's still five hundred bucks. Yeah, you know, and you're gonna do it anyway. Yeah, I'm gonna do that after party anyways, no matter what, because I'm going drinking somewhere after a fight. Right, right, and it's not <laughs> like I mean, and once you're there, it's all covered for yeah. you. And the, I mean, that was the other part of it was my bar tab was usually covered, but my bar tab was never really that high because. Been gone, gone Everybody's six, buying you drinks yeah. anyway. And it was six weeks of no drinking, so I, I had a low tolerance. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> and, and somebody buy, we had a, one guy used to sponsor me that would 
first thing he would do is order uh, 50 Irish car bombs. Oh, fuck. And I love those. Things. The, He's so the, good. The <sighs> next the next thing that happened usually was I, I would try and get through as many as I could, and then I'd usually puke. <laughs> 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 because you, all of it hits you at once, and you're just, ugh. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we had, we, I mean, that's his way to do the stuff, and people just didn't understand it. Right. And uh, once the once the the bars found out what kind of business you actually brought in, they would they were all about it. Like, when are you doing your next fight? I mean, I had some good good bars that would sponsor me, and some some that uh, screwed around and screwed up their business, and I just didn't use them again. They'd be like, "Oh, we're we're only gonna do ten percent of whatever they sell." Okay, whatever. And then I know one person has a bar tab of seven hundred bucks. And I know I, I get paid sixty bucks from them. I was like, I know you guys screwed me. Yeah, because you know? I mean, you already yeah, just from one person. So you lo- you lost uh you lost my business you lost my business to help your business. Now we're going to the guy next door and you're getting screwed out of that business. Yeah, yeah. Some people are so short sighted in business. It's just mm-hmm. a terrible. I mean, it's just a terrible uh, view to have. It is, and they learn lessons in life, I guess. And uh, their lesson in life is I don't give my business anymore. I don't have to down down talk them, but when uh, I won't say the names of the businesses that screw me over the years because I have, I mean, I've done, been doing this fucking since 2012. I've been pro, but uh, they got screwed because they, the business next door would be packed and people would see the, all the people in there. That'd be the place that's popping. They would go to that place. Mm-hmm. So that night they would go, why is everybody over this place and not over at our place? They come in and as well as it's Johnny Irish's after party for his fight. Uh, that's the guy we screwed over. Well, you learn a lesson in life, and that's the way I look at it. If you screw, if you screw me over, I don't use you again. Yeah. And you should learn your lesson for the next person that you try and screw over and you think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, shit, man. You got to learn that lesson at some point in time. Yeah. I would, I, I would hope anyway. You would hope. Some people don't. I know, I know those people that don't. Those are people that just hopefully they don't go far in life. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they do, and you're just like, what the hell, karma? But <laughs> Dude, and you've had a lot of fights. How many fights have you had total? Oh, crap. I've, I should know this. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, people ask uh, me that, and I'm just like, ah. <laughs> I want to say 15, 16. Yeah. 16 pro fights, and then amateur, man, I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, you racked up a lot of those. There's a lot of uh, boxing, kickboxing, MMA. Muay Thai. Um, Muay Thai. They all add up. I don't, we don't have too many Muay Thai ones. I think I have one Muay Thai fight, uh, actual Muay Thai kick, uh, amateur fight. Okay, but I got one. A, and then I had uh, some kickboxing, boxing, and MMA. Man, I'd say there's probably 30-something there. Yeah. So around 50, I'd guess. It's a lot of fights regardless. And that's not including, I mean, if you want to include bar fights, I couldn't even start counting. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different category. That's yeah, a whole different category. <laughs> Shit, dude. Yeah, so um, so you just wrapped up with this last one, and um, did you sell a shit ton of tickets for that one too? Uh, I sold I sold my tickets that they gave me. I sold. Uh, I sent people to other fighters. I probably, if I would have taken uh, money for this fight, I probably would have uh, – Probably would have made a killing, but yeah. I did. I mean, it was all charity. Yeah. So, it was. So some, uh, of the, some, some of what, yeah. What were they raising money for? So this is for that, guns and hoses, yeah, right? Guns and, guns and hoses is for backstoppers. Uh, they they're raising money for backstoppers for fallen police officers and firefighters and uh, any uh, first responders. Um, because police officers get killed, firefighters get killed. Uh, trying to save people, and um, it's one of the situations where. They just bring up all the money, and that's one of the things that during my family's always done is gone to Guns and Hoses. So all the all the last fight I did was basically for uh, raising money. My cousin was the hero of the show, cousin Ryan O'Connor. Um, so I, I always wanted to fight for backstoppers, and I just never was a cop or a firefighter or anything. I tried a couple times to get on for certain things, and it just never came to fruition. And when this fight got offered, I was like, this is a perfect ending career fight oh, absolutely and uh I, I don't think i can top it and there's no reason to try yeah so i mean i was on the news and everything which freaked me out and <laughs> stuff like that yeah dude that's a hell of a story you know yeah. like it's a good it's a good cause it, as i said i told one of the persons it was like, people that are asking me uh i said i couldn't if i wrote a book i couldn't end it better than this so and i, I don't think i could yeah dude and you went out with a quick win yeah uh kid was uh, I went up a couple weight classes. I had a fight at one. Uh, uh, weight gain was at one forty two. I usually fight at like one fifteen, one twenty five. Mm-hmm. So now don't get me wrong. I was heavy when they first called me for it, but uh, I I could have made one thirty five, one twenty five easily. 
Yeah, but it's less miserable if you yeah. don't. <laughs> but I also look fat as crap when I, they put me on Channel 11 News. And you're not all the, ripped out. It's like, listen, guys, this isn't my, my normal belly, fight shape. My belly hanging over the, the pants. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was um, the guy was type of guy that I wanted to fight. He was a tough guy. Um, had a type of, uh, ex- type of experience I wanted and the type of fighter I wanted to fight for my last fight. And um, it was a fun fight. And I didn't, it didn't do exactly like I wanted to. I wanted to land with, some, I wanted to finish with something cool to say, you know, I went out with a Peruvian necktie or something like that or yeah. uh, a mirror lock, but the guy didn't tap to him. So I had to do one of my basic white belt setups. So uh, I called Ninja Turtle Sweep to arm bar and the rope screwed me up a little bit because you're not used to doing those mm-hmm. after doing so many years of MMA. So, but it was a fun little, uh, fun fight, fun win. And, um, I got to get my dad, uh, a, a good birthday present with um, giving him the uh, Guns and Hoses ring. Yeah. That I know he'll wear. It's too big for my hand. I look like I won the midget, uh, midget uh, Super Bowl. And shit. <laughs> That's funny, dude. No, but there's some beauty in that in the sense that, you know, like armbar is one of the first things that you learn. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I mean, that's a hell of a way to end a career, too, with just one of the most principal moves there is in jiu-jitsu. And uh, – I think that was one of the first submissions and first setups I learned when I started jujitsu all those years ago, like 2007. Yeah, I think that was one of the first submissions I learned was that uh, that you do the sweep and you they go you go to mount, mm-hmm. you, you get underneath them, and you grab the double wrist, and you go to mount or you go to or they post and then you take the arm. And I went for one arm, and uh, the rope screwed me up, so I had to switch to the other arm, which got it even tighter actually. Yeah, but uh, I think it was one of the first moves I used. I still use it to this day. But it was a set. It was a nice little setup. I was I was never an ath- I was never a professional athlete. I was a professional fighter. I was never athletic. I uh, I would do I would do like misdirection to get people to get submitted. Like I'd play with something to make them think about that thing and then go for something else. Yeah. You know they'd be worried about the one thing. You go for the other thing. Yeah, you've always. And where did you start training at? I started training at JW Wrights. Uh, I actually started training Krav Maga, and JW came to Krav Maga. And then uh, I switched over to JWs a lot, and then from JWs I went to Burgers. Okay, was this back in the days when JW was? Um, was he had he started his school and he was just doing <laughs> jujitsu, or was he still? He didn't have his own school at that point in time. He was actually out of a Taekwondo gym. Okay, was he teaching sambo at that time too? Uh, or? He did. He taught me sambo. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> I bought privates from him. But uh, okay. he did a lot of. He was a, he was a black belt in sambo, and I think he was a brown belt, right? Maybe a purple belt, maybe a brown belt. Right when I started with JW. Okay, so he was still kind of early in his jujitsu career. Yeah, I mean, he was still f- far advanced from a lot of people in sure. St. Louis. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was in his jujitsu career. I think maybe he just got his brown belt, or he might have been a purple belt. Well, yeah, into brown I belt. mean, at that time there wasn't, a, you know, yeah. a lot of schools, or I mean, maybe two. Yeah, maybe if that. And yeah. there was a, and that sambo <laughs> guy he trained under. Uh, he did enough with him, and then he kind of switched over to the Gracies. Okay. So, I mean, he was a huge, huge ground guy, but he, there was nowhere to train then. Yeah. That's how old, that's how old I am. <laughs> yeah. No, I had, we had JW on the podcast. It was a really good conversation. Um, so, uh, how long were you with, how long were you there? I've been basically on and off with JW since I started. Really? Uh, I, like, just, I would train with JW, and then I'd be at another gym doing more MMA. And burgers, then when I, right? Yeah, burgers. You know, I've went to every freaking gym in You've St. Louis. You've been everywhere, bro. Yeah. <laughs> basically every gym in St. Louis, <laughs> other than like two. Um, I bounced around and trying to find the right fit at the right point in time in my life. Yeah. Which is kind of what you need when you need more of a structured uh, base when you're a more structured person. Ten years is a long time to be, you know, in a sport. And it, it's nice if you could find a coach to kind of be there along the entire path. But if there's definitely some mentors that you can, like, check back in with and different yeah. things. Like, I mean, as we evolve and grow, I mean, you, you may not have the same coach your whole life, yeah. right? I mean, you, most likely you won't. So it's just kind of – it is what it is. And, yeah, you're, you're – whatever your uh – your path is at that point in time is kind of where the gym you're going to be more led to. Yeah. Like right now my path is I'm at, I'm at Wolves Den and I'm at JW's and that's kind of the path I'm at is you, it, go and have fun and do what you do. It's not so structured. It's not, you have to be here now or you're doing up downs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I definitely enjoy the life of, uh, not having like fight camps anymore. Yeah. Because just so many days to where you know you're you're trying to like rush to get to practice at like four thirty. Yeah. So you and you know what I mean. And then like you never feel like you're getting everything in that you want to, right? Because 
man, you gotta you gotta lift, you gotta wrestle, you gotta do jujitsu, yep. you gotta strike, you gotta throw it all together in MMA, right? Like you you want to do gi and no gi, like you. <laughs> it's like working. At, uh, I always look uh, likened it to work. Like you go and you get a job at working at your favorite restaurant. Mm-hmm. It's not your favorite restaurant anymore after you get the job there. No, because you're gonna be like, man, I hate this fucking place. Yeah, you I know? just got and tired of getting punched in the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never got tired of that. I got tired of I had taken down and taken down and held down. <laughs> oh yeah, well see, I dude, yeah. I just do nothing but jujitsu these days. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm gonna be here very shortly. I was yeah. like, I swear, I think I'm, I'm. I don't know where I'm going next, but I think it's gonna be just jujitsu. Yeah, I got set a new bar. I think I've hit all of them. But, uh, you know, it's one of the things like time, timing, timing is a big thing for gyms too. Yeah. My daughter gets off the bus at like three thirty, and you know, you got to go drop them off at the grandmother's house and then get to the gym by four thirty, and you're late every time and you got to do up downs every time. It's a rush, dude. You know, yeah. and you get there like four forty five, like the people are pissed off that you're there 15 minutes late. Yeah. You can't do nothing about it. Yeah. Or if like, I mean, in my case, like, I mean, I worked like a nine to five. So yeah. like normally I got off at like four or four thirty. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like I'm rushing out of there just to get to practice. Yeah. You know? And it's not fun to do. You kind of, you know, everybody's going and getting after work drinks and you're flying to go get punched in the face. <laughs> and it's not something you think, man, I really want to get to the gym as fast as I can. Hey, man, I really like to go out to the happy hour with all my coworkers and talk about the shit that happened at work today. Yeah. Well, when you're deep in it, I don't think you're necessarily having those thoughts, but it is, it's just maybe in hindsight, you start thinking yeah. about that stuff because in the moment, like, I'm like, man, fuck, I'm trapped here. I'd rather be at the gym right now going and training, right? Yeah. Whenever you're like, you're in full go, but, uh. Yeah, it can definitely, that, um, it's just a full-time thing, you know what I mean? Wake up in the morning, at least for me, like, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd run, then I'd go to work, work the 9 to 5, get off, go train, be there from anywhere from <laughs> two to two, two and a half hours, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, gosh, go home, do whatever else you gotta do, I mean, repeat. I, w- I mean, I had a really funky schedule, I didn't wake up and run, but uh, my funky schedule was, I'd go to the gym, then I'd go to work, and I'd get off of work, and I'd go to the gym. Then I go to sleep for a couple hours, and I go to the gym, and then I'd get get out, go to work, and then I go to the gym because I work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I work twelve to fifteen hour shifts. God, and you work overnight, right? I work overnight, which is hell. Oh my god! And it's work on the east side. It's fun time, man. <clears throat> no, I don't know how you do that. You go days without sleeping. Very. I mean, not a lot of people can, but I I go days without sleeping, I, and it's uh, sometimes it affects me, sometimes it doesn't, because you I know my body well enough to know I'll get a second and third wind. Like, I'll be super tired when I get off. Yeah. And then if I go and, like, train or something, I'll get a second wind. And I realize after I train I get the second wind, I know I'm not going to sleep that day. Really? I was like, because I'll be, I'll have energy. And yeah. And I go, crap. So I, I'm sitting, I'm laying in bed, laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, can't go to sleep. And then. And this is I, during the day? This is during the day. Yeah. The sun hits you too, it screws you. Yeah, that makes sense because once you, once, I mean, you get sun exposure, then your cortisol levels, you yep. know, they kind of fucking. <sighs> forgot the word but like they go up yeah um so yeah they uh yeah so you're gonna be awake at that time oh yeah and that that screws me because as soon as sun hits me i'm like a vampire it pops me awake yeah and i can't deal with i can't even there's no there's no and people are out party like go, playing with their kids they're in the yards and stuff and you hear all those sounds and those are things that wake you up too mm-hmm. not just the sound of it but the happiness kind of gets flowed into your head. Like I should be out with my kid playing on the yard, playing baseball, throwing, playing catch and stuff like that. And it snaps you awake too. Yeah. So all those things kind of bind against you, I guess, and makes you stay awake. Yeah. Well, I mean like the world is all operating, right? So you like, you don't want to like miss all of that all the time. Yeah. So I only, I worked a third shift uh, one time and it was, it was right after, I think it was 2011. I moved back here from San Antonio, and I worked third shift um, doing security. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just read a lot of books and watched movies and different things. But you're up all night, and then like you get off. I can definitely think of a couple times where I went probably 24 hours without sleeping because like I get off, and then I'm up with the kids or doing all the normal day stuff, and then like maybe you try to catch a nap or something during the day before you go train again if you can catch it yeah yeah if it's raining during the day like water puts me to sleep yeah. the sound of water knocks me the hell out but if it's a sunny day it's really tough and you try and black out your room as much as you can but yeah some light sneaks in and it still hits you yeah the light definitely sneaks in man it's hard um during the day yeah fucking you put like a little waterfall <laughs> in your room or something to get that noise i try i, I get this weird <laughs> thing where i go and lay in i go in uh 
uh, turn the shower on and lay on the bathroom floor with the covers and stuff. Yeah. That puts me to sleep. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Yeah. But works so damn well for me. Hey, whatever works, dude, because sleep is one of the most important fucking things. Agreed. Yeah. What's the craziest shit you've seen working at the, uh, on the east side? <laughs> that, that, you're, not, you're getting into, <laughs> um, <laughs> man, I, the craziest shit I've seen, the craziest shit that's happened. Well, what happened last Tuesday? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, how, well, like, how the fuck do we ask this question? We've had, uh, I mean, I've had incidents where, uh, I've had guys pull guns on me, um, we had an incident once where a guy was trying to force my wife outside, uh, um, trying to force my wife to leave, and I was trying to leave. <clears throat> Long story short, uh, the guy starts trying to pick a fight with me. He's a larger, uh, larger guy than me, uh, obviously, if you've seen me. <laughs> and um, got to the point where I'm trying to beg him not to start shit because I'm trying not to get into a fight. And he ends up um, cocking back to hit me, and so I headbutt him <laughs> and split his eye open. Oh, shit. And uh, he back he falls out of his he falls out of his bar stool because we're both like half sitting down and shit. And uh, I was I would step in between him and my wife. I was like, hey, this is my chair and you're at my table, blah 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 blah. And uh, when he caught back to hit me, I had but um he backs up and he backs up about ten feet. Anybody that's been in a street fight or a bar fight, no, he got two decisions there. He's either gonna rush you or he's gonna run. He's not gonna stand there and wait for you to walk to him. And I'm like, all right, dude, you're leaking, go away. And uh, as he's doing that, he starts to reach in his pants, and I realize he's got something. I didn't know what it was. I started running at him, threw, throwing punches before I even got to him. I hit him a couple times, and uh, I realize, as he's pull, as I realize he's pulling a gun out, I lit him up a couple times. He went to the ground. He, as I'm yelling at him to stay down, and uh, he stands back up. He starts reaching again. I grab him around the waist, and I suplex him on his head and knock him out. <sighs> and uh, <laughs> I don't even know this is the weirdest one. This was crazy. Uh, they ended up. He ended up, um, he's spilling blood everywhere. And the security grabs him and pulls him outside. Well, he tries to pull the gun on security. Cops arrest him. Ended up, he had something to the effect of he had, the gun was either not registered, or he had murders on the gun or something already. And uh, we had that situation. We have guys pull guns on me a couple times. We had a couple drive-bys on me um, from guys that would try and either rob me or try and punk me on at Roxy's when I was working there. Yeah. Um had guys that would shoot at you and stuff like that. Holy shit, dude. How many times have you been shot at? I can't count. That's like count bar fights to me, man. Dude. It's uh, it's rarer these days, I'll say that, because working over where I work now compared to where I worked in Brooklyn, was uh, where I worked in Brooklyn, it was pretty consistent every weekend. Brooklyn, Illinois, for the yeah. folks listening. Yeah, Brooklyn, Illinois versus <laughs> where I'm at now. <laughs> um, now it's a lot safer. It's a lot more upscale. Then it was people come by and it, this is – I don't know how to really word this. I don't look like um, I could I could um, protect myself. Well, just if if people just want to be dicks, just from yeah. like, from height alone. Yeah, height you know? alone. I don't look like I could. I, if you came up and tried to rob me, I don't look like I'd be able to stop you. And I surprised a hell out of people. So, and that's what usually happened over there when Brooklyn was around. Uh, those strip clubs not even even around anymore because of how crazy it got. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, most of that's closed all down. Oh, shit. I was in there the heyday when it was a wild, wild west. We had drive-bys where we had one drive-by uh, they talk about to this day. Um, my first week in there, we had a drive-by. On, I had a guy on my stand, and I almost got lit up my fr- my second night there. And it was like, he's not ever coming back. And I put it in my head. I was like, I'm, I'm not coming back unless I made this amount of money this night. And I made like $20 over that amount of money I put in my head. <laughs> I was like, shit, I gotta come back. <laughs> so they they bought you. Yeah, and that's basically what it was. And we had incidents where guy would try and rob me, and I'd knock him out, and uh, he'd come back by and do a, try to drive by on me because I make him look embarrassed what? in front of his homies. And one of the times where I thought I was done, I was like, I heard a, I heard his car slow down right outside where I was standing, and I was right by the road. And I went, oh shit! I looked back. And it was a guy, he had a gun out the window, and I went, oh, crap, I can't go anywhere because I'm blocked in. There's nowhere I can run to. So I just crossed my arms and I stared at him. I was like, I'm dead. I know I'm getting shot. And I just stared at the guy, and he unloaded. And he missed me from 15, 10 feet away. Missed me with every bullet. Thank God I'm small. And, I mean, it looked like a cartoon of how he missed me. It must have went all around my body, like... Uh, Roger Rabbit or some crap <laughs> outlining Dude, I, in my body. I feel so in like just tense right now. Just hearing oh, it was, that situation. It, <laughs> and it's, what's jacked up is you don't 
you quit ducking after a certain amount of times being shot at, which is the most weird thing to say and most stupid thing to say. But we would hear, like during um, uh, New Year's Eve is one of the big ones. You hear gunshots for four hours because the people are shooting guns in the air. That's a, that's a, it's like a tradition. It's a tradition. A if, you live in, if you live in North County or North City, that's what you hear all the time, and bullets are bouncing off the ground. We we had that where we were sitting there laughing and joking, talking like we wouldn't go inside or go and look for cover, and then all of a sudden you look around on the ground and bullets are landing right near you. Yeah. And uh, they were like hitting concrete and busting concrete up. And people used to say like, if it comes from the sky and it comes down, it loses the velocity, it won't hurt you. Yes, it will fucking hurt you. It's busting concrete up. It'll go through your skull. Yeah, no, it, it can still. Yeah, that's what fucking kills me about that because I think they do that all over the world. I think that's just like a thing. And it's the dumbest shit in the planet. Yeah, because man, whatever goes, it must come down. It has to it, come back down, and it's still gonna like to say it, it loses. But, like, what are you talking about? It's, it's not gonna coming lose. with enough velocity. I mean, a golf ball will kill you if you get hit in the head by it. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm not. A, I don't know all the fucking physics and whatnot, but I'm. I mean, there's there's gravity, and it's it's coming down. Yeah. I feel like it's still, it's gonna gain momentum. It can. And it's still good. Uh, go through. Have some enough it's, momentum to go through your skin skull. Yeah, man. I wonder how many people get killed from bullets just like falling out of the fucking sky. You know, because I know MythBusters did something, uh, and I watched not long ago, and it said, "Oh, it's not gonna kill you if it comes goes up and comes down." And I went, I watched it go through my cooler and hit concrete. I was like, my skull is not as strong as a cooler and a soda and concrete. Hmm. My your skull's only that big, you know, and it's it's going through and it's chipping concrete and busting up this. This lead bullet. Yeah. You know, you know it's jacked up. You know it's going to go through you. That's going to you, So you've never been shot? Uh, we have, well, there was an incident where I don't know if I was ever shot or hit with a rock from a ricochet, <laughs> but when I was a young kid, uh, oh. when I was a young kid living in, I think I think I was living in uh, Lima or something then, and somebody did drive by on me when I was, I guess I was like seventh grade, and uh, it hit it hit concrete. We don't know what hit me, but it didn't, pe- it busted up my ankle, but it didn't penetrate with yeah like you know, flesh wound yeah so it was a little bit of nothing could have been anything yeah it could have been anything could have been a rock could have been something something went through my shoe and hit my ankle though. now you hear people talk about getting shot though and they say it's like it's like a it's like that it's like getting hit with a rock or like a yeah. bite or like you know what i mean like this it hurt this, it hurt whatever the hell hit me <laughs> yeah it's like this this sharp puncture pain but it's like like you wouldn't think it's a shot guns don't bother me as much as knives do yeah. Because usually if you deal with somebody with a knife, you're getting cut no matter how good you are at weapon retention, which I'm very, very good at. If you pull a gun on me, and I, I can react quick enough and get the gun and pull the gun away from you. Yeah. Which I've done a few times. Knives are one of those things where I've been stabbed a couple times. Yeah. You will get cut. Yeah. It's just what severity. Yeah. How severe? I mean, you don't know if they're going to get through your heart or you're going to get through your hand. I've had been stabbed in the hand, stabbed in the arm, stabbed in the side. Oh, God and, damn. Uh, I mean, it's just those are usually those are usually street fights or something like that. <sighs> I've had guns pull on me so many damn times. The reason I'm married to this day is because I had a gun pull on me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shit, that's a hell of a way to do it. Yeah. I was, uh, <laughs> it was my wife since I was 17. Yeah. Her parents hated my guts. And uh, one of the times uh, when they started kind of coming around to me, we were I took her and dropped off a Backstreet Boys concert. And I was with my brother-in-law and one of his friends. And we are down in the loop. The dude tried, uh, dude tried robbing all of us. I knew he was trying to rob us. And uh, he didn't really come out. The come out. He's like, "Hey, you guys want to buy any blah blah blah?" blah. I'm like, "No, nah, man, we're not interested. You want to buy it?" I said, "Hey, man, listen, don't do it. I know what you're about to do. Don't do it." And he pulled the gun out. Ended up uh, waiting for him to. He kept putting the gun away when cars drove by. I waited for one of the cars to drive by, and I grabbed the gun and I punched him in the face. And he uh, he ended up uh, knocked him out and took off running. Yeah, buddy, coming across the street. So Crystal's mom, my wife's mom. Hated my guts, thinking I was just a derelict, which she wasn't wrong. <laughs> uh, but she's—I I, she thought I saved her her son's night, life, so she kind of came around on me. So she let me continue dating her daughter. Yeah, and here we are, all these years later. Yeah, I was sixteen years, seventeen years old. <sighs> You're a special breed, dude, because I married my high school sweetheart, and uh, that was the wrong fucking move. <laughs> <laughs> that was the wrong fucking move. Um, we're just two different people, and like I feel like at that age, um, like the driving force for me to want to be with somebody, <laughs> just fucking just just nature and hormones running the fucking game, and just me just sacrificing whatever sort of happiness I want just for that for that little bit of yeah. <laughs> momentarily happiness. Well, I met. I mean, I had a I had a crazy life before I met my wife. Yeah, like I lived a 
insane life before then. And I mean, as weird as it is now. Yeah. It's never it's never gotten any crazier than than what it was in the beginning. And uh, I met her when I was I, well, actually I started dating her the first time when I was when I was a freshman in high school, and then I ended up dating her again when we were uh, juniors in high school. And I came home and I was like, I, f- I fell in love, and I told my mom, I told my mom, I was like, hey, listen, I found the girl I'm gonna marry. And my mom knew from that day on. She goes, Dan always whatever he said he was gonna do, he was gonna do. Yeah. And that's always where I've been. I've I've hit every bar I ever wanted to hit. <laughs> <laughs> as bad as that is, but uh, I, I she knew that I was gonna marry the girl, and I I married her, and I've been with her since I was seventeen. I'm fucking thirty six now. <sighs> Damn, dude, almost twenty years, bro. Yeah, seventeen, thirty, yeah, almost twenty years. Yeah, nineteen years. Yep, and I have two kids with her, and yeah. uh, I mean she's she keeps me grounded. She's a driving force behind me because I wouldn't be able to do half the stuff I've done without her. Yeah, she I mean she's my. She my world, and I love her to death. And- yeah. Well, you guys have made it through a very, like, uh, a difficult, like, life point. You know what I mean? Like, those early years in life, yeah. which is why I feel like a lot of people don't make it, myself included, was, you know, like, your brain's still fucking format, like, still forming. Like, you're learning who you are. Like, there's just a lot of change and different things that are happening. And mm-hmm. then, uh, like, when you're going through that with another person who's also changing and all that shit, like, what are the odds of making it through that? And we're opposites in a lot of regards, you know, and it was, uh, it was one of those things where opposites attract and, you know, we've, we've had, we went through some tough times in life. Yeah. A lot of tough times. And she just kind of kept me centered and I kept her a little bit wild. I can dig it. And it it was, uh, it was perfect combination where, um, oil and oil and water, I guess. Yeah. Perfect combination. You level each other out, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you level each other out with. All this, all my insanity that you don't always want all the time, and how all her stability, and she, I get to give her a little insanity that she has fun with. Yeah, you know she's a she's a, quite a freaking girl to deal with the crap I'd have to deal with all the time, and <sighs> Fuck you know your husband gets shot at and stabbed and yeah. gets in fights all the time, and cops cops are looking for him for fart for, for uh, getting in bar fights, and then realize he didn't do nothing wrong. When they when they come and see it, I'm five three and the guy's six six. <laughs> <laughs> He's picking on me. I didn't know what to do. I hit him. Hey man, fuck dude. You know you gotta you gotta take care of yourself. Yeah, and I mean she's dealt with a lot of those craziness. I mean being a bouncer, she saw me having to take on ten guys and get them outside the door and shit like that. So she saw all that stuff and yeah. When she stayed there, <laughs> dude. Yeah, fuck dude. Hey, more power to her. Yeah, I mean she's a saint. I mean, I've been in love since I was 17 years old. That's just insanity. Yeah. And I think she has been. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I wanted to ask you about, um, since we've kind of, it's a perfect segue because we're, we're talking kind of like more of the beginning of your life. Dude, you grew up on Chuck Berry's property, right? Yep. Uh, well, I, gr- I grew up, I started off in Jennings, and then my parents uh, moved to Lake St. Louis, and they got a divorce. My mom moved a lot growing up. Uh, a lot of places we lived, and we moved back to Chuck Berry's property. Uh, quite a few times, my aunt was really good friends with him, and uh, he was a friend of the family. So we lived a lot of times on Chuck Berry's property. Man, that's cool. What? Uh, so where is that at? Like, what's it like? It's in Winsville off of Buckner Road. Oh uh, yeah. It was a. Uh, it was like my buddy always called it compound, because it's gated in. Oh. And uh, we um. <clears throat> it, we moved to hit a lot of uh, mod, mobile homes like on the property. Oh yeah. And uh. We would move from place to place on the property, basically, off and on. And uh, a lot of times we stayed on Chuck Berry's property. And we'd, mm. My mom was bipolar, and we'd move around a lot because uh, she would she would all of a sudden get a get a hinkling to, hey, we need to move. <laughs> so <laughs> I was always ready to move when I was a kid. So I lived a lot of places. That's why I learned how to fight is because you're always a new kid. But um, we'd move a lot, and uh, it was off of Buckner Road in uh, Wentzville, and it's called Berry Park. And we, I mean, we, I go and meet famous people and have a lot of weird stories of famous people because just they come over to visit Chuck. Yeah. So. Man, dude, I can't, I can't imagine what it would be like as a kid to, uh, to kind of be around, uh, cause when you're, when you're a kid, like the, like, um, like who people are, like you don't really know who they yeah. are. You know what I mean? Did you know who Chuck Berry was then? I had an idea. Um. You didn't understand it so much as a kid, um, as how big he was. 
because he was just some guy that would come over to your house and your mom would make him gumbo or potato soup and he would take it home and uh and he'd come and hang out with you, and he'd see you, like, you'd call him up and ask him if he'd go swim in the pool with uh, one of your girlfriends at that point in time, or some of your friends, and he'd be like, I know it's a problem. And that's kind of the situation is that he would live across the street. He lived, like, a football field away. Yeah, he's just a guy. He's just If a he person. was that far away. And I got some weird stories with Chuck that I won't get into, but, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was as weird as people said, but he was also, he's one of the nicest guys on the planet to me. He uh, he helped out when my mom didn't have a lot of money. Um he would help. He always had a place for us to stay when we didn't have a place to stay. Yeah. So as weird as he was, um, he was just a dude that he he liked women. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, as the story uh, goes. As the story goes. Uh, but he's also a great guy. Uh, yeah. He did a lot of stuff for me. He's just a human being. Yeah. Yeah, man. Sometimes I feel like um, I don't know how I want to word this. Well, I feel like. We hold entertainers and and different people sometimes to too high of a standard. Um, I, I I can understand both arguments in the sense of like when you are a public figure, like you you I I would want to portray myself a certain way, right, in a certain light. But not everybody is me. You know what I mean? Not everybody it, um, has a certain the same uh, like upbringing or values or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all just fucking people. You know yeah. what I mean? It's so crazy. And you can take that, you can extrapolate that to almost anything because we act like just because a person has a certain job that they're going to be up to this certain moral code and that may not be the fucking case. Yeah. Go ahead. Go use the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, dude, don't even worry about it. I'm just going to keep on, uh, just keep on rocking and, uh, and you can do your thing. Yeah, yeah, do what you got to do. I'm just going to keep talking to the folks. Um, <laughs> yeah, folks. All right, so let me lean in. Do I talk to the camera? So I'm recording this. I'm here. Either way. Um, so, yeah, guys, this is uh, this is my buddy, Danny O'Connor. And, uh, excuse me, um, like I said, I wanted to have him on the podcast because – in the best way possible, if you can't tell by now, Danny is the craziest son of a bitch I know, and it's it's crazy. I uh, he so one time uh, we were going to a a uh, what was it a Fourth of July party or something, and I was bringing my girlfriend, and I was like I was like. You know, you're introducing her and you're telling her about different people. I'm like, we got there. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's my buddy Dan. And I'm just like, I'm like, he does. I'm like, he works overnights um, at the strip club on the east side. Like, I go, he goes days without sleeping. I go, I can't tell you how many times he's been shot at. Like, you start running down the list of, uh, like, you know, the resume of all these different things. You know what I mean? Like, things that I've never gone through. But, hey, man, you know, we all have our own fucking path. And uh, I'm just like, like, she doesn't even believe me. Like, I'm like, no, yeah, this is all true. Like, I'm not lying right now. Like, and then, and then you go and say, hey, come here, such and such. Hey, come here. Like, you start having them, like, confirm all of these details. And then it's like, yeah, yeah, like, that's all true. And it's just like, oh, shit. It's like, so I just knew that I had to share this with you guys because why the fuck would I not do that? Sorry. No, here we are. I've been crushing uh, gallons of water a day trying to get this weight off of me. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep it going fl- through you, bro. No, I was just telling the folks on, like, why I wanted to have you here, which I already kind of told you about. Um, I was so – I think it was probably two years ago now. I don't know, one of the Helm Fest or something. Mm-hmm. And um, I was bringing my, my now girlfriend, and we were just kind of uh, – we were driving out there, and I'm just like, she was just meeting everybody at the time, and I think we got there. I'm like, oh yeah, like that's Danny, and like I'm giving the rundown. I'm like, oh he like, I'm like, this dude goes days without sleeping. Like he works on the east side, but like I can't. And then like you start telling her this shit, like I'm telling her these things, and like she doesn't like believe me. So then I'm like, I'm like, hey, like Matt, like Sarah, like come here, like whoever, like. And then they start confirming the shit. <laughs> it's it's so bad in life where you have to like actually uh, You're a myth, bro. leave dot leave details and certain things out of your stories because when you start telling them 
and you see people's face change, like they don't believe this is happening. <laughs> like you have to have police reports to be- for people to believe what actually happened. Yeah. And uh, it's so bad in life because <clears throat> I, 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 people ask me to write a book all the time. And I, I always say, I was like, dude, I can't because people aren't going to believe that this fucking happened. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe that this happened. Like I'll have incidents where people will look at me and go, what the fucking shit just happened? And I go, this is my life. I have no I reason say, not to believe. I was like, I, I have, uh, I'll, I'll downgrade certain things in my life. Like I won't tell people certain parts of the stories because it sounds too outlandish. Yeah. And I go, that there's no way that happened. And then you show them pictures of uh, you at um, the opening Planet Hollywood talking to uh, talking to like with the all autographs of people that were at Planet Hollywood and go, yeah, I, I hung out with uh, Stephen Baldwin and I hung out with uh, all these people and I got into a fight with um, with Bruce Willis's uh, bodyguard at the, <laughs> when I was fourteen years old and uh, I love it. and l- laid him out and um, the stories like that or. <clears throat> I and mean, some of the stuff that Chuck used to tell you, and you, it, people would. I've had after Chuck passed away, they I had people I had a one guy calling me, offering me about it was five hundred thousand dollars to write a book about some of the stuff they didn't, that nobody knew about Chuck. But I sat down, thought about it, and I was like, you know, this guy did so much nice stuff for me, and all the stuff this guy's gonna ask about is gonna be bad stuff. Yeah. So I, I, I turned it down. Name. Yeah, and I turned it down, <laughs> and uh, I didn't. <laughs> man, that money would have been nice, but I couldn't do it because I'm I'm all about character. And he did, uh, he, he was, I, I got stories that nobody's ever heard about the guy, <laughs> but I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it up paper to pen, or pen to paper and talk bad about him because he did a lot of stuff. And he saved me from getting arrested a couple of times when I like girls, dads would come showing up at the house that I had dated and hooked up with and they're coming to beat the crap out of me or, um, doing stupid crap as a kid. And Chuck would say, you know, he, he was, uh, he was with me the entire time, stuff like that. Oh, you know, yeah. he did a lot of stuff for me, and he did help me out and help my family. My mom lived there until she passed away and killed herself. Uh, she lived on his property then. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. That was there? Yeah. Hmm. So he always had a place for my family to stay. He loved me, and he loved my mom, and he looked after me. He did a lot of nice things for me, so I never, I didn't want to tarnish his name more than it's been tarnished over the years and say things about him and anybody else that I knew that lived on the property. Yeah. Which I knew. I know all the, I knew the, all the ins and outs, and. My life's never going to be bad enough that I would talk bad about the guy. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, fuck, man. Loyalty is far more valuable than, than money. Yeah. I look at his character. I was like, yeah, I'm big about character. I don't I don't have to lie. I don't lie about anything because um, I think uh, one of the mob bosses said, there's only reason you lie is if you're uh, scared of the person, you're scared of the consequences. And I'm not scared of any person on the planet. And that's kind of the way I look at things. I don't need to lie. My, yeah. my life's already crazy enough where I have to I, I lie in the opposite regard, right? I downgrade stories. I leave out details of certain stories because it sounds crazier. It sounds too crazy if I tell you exactly what happened. I'm going to give you like a rough draft of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the thing is some people are obviously fucking liars, right? Yeah. And um, But at the end of the day, I mean, somebody has to live this life. Whatever this like, I mean, there's so many human beings out there, and there's so many fucking journeys, and like, just because somebody's experience isn't your experience, it doesn't make it not true. But here's where I could be. But here's where here's where I came up with my way of downgrading my stories of the incidents that happened in my life was if you're telling the story and you're telling it, and you know it's going to sound outlandish when you're telling it. That you downgrade it because the person's gonna call you a liar or bullshit, and they're gonna be pissed off, and you're gonna get into a fight with a guy. And I figured out throughout my life to to bring your story back a couple notches from what it actually was, where it sounds more believable. But it's true. You're just not telling the more insanity of it. Like you're not gonna say I dove out a two story window to run from the cops. You're gonna say I I got away for the cops got there or something like that. Because he's saying that something like that when you're a 15-year-old kid. Like, a yeah, cop showed up and we're at a party and we're all drinking. And I, I jumped out the window and hit the hill and rolled down the hill and ran from the cops. As opposed to, we all got away for the cops got there. You know, it sounds sounds more believable because people are going to be like, no way, jump out a two-story window. Because that's something they wouldn't do. Yeah, but you could definitely do it. Yeah, and I, that's, that's one of the stories <laughs> I talk about. Shit, dude. Uh, in high school, dude, I had this. I, I knew this kid, and um, he, he he filmed it, though. He filmed himself jumping out of the second-story window. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And that's kind of the crap that 
I would just do – I didn't think before I did a lot of stuff. And uh, thank Christ I never got too severely injured in the dumb crap I did. Yeah. But I did a lot of dumb crap. <laughs> Dude. I was like, it's just um, – it's one of those things in my life where I just I, – I've done so much stuff. I don't know where to go through next, to go to next. It's like I say, I, I, I'm done fighting now. What do I do next? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't know. I just dove deeper into jujitsu. Is what I did. It's mm. kind of what I'm thinking too. But I gotta figure out what my next, part, next act of my life's gonna be. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, maybe I need to try and set the bar of becoming a millionaire this time. So, <laughs> Dude, so I have money or something. I always go for that. Cause I I never set the bar. I never liked money. <sighs> I love money. I less care about money, just more of what it does. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Money is not the most important thing in the world by any means, but it's pretty fucking important because <laughs> as much as I don't like it, like we have to – there's a certain game that we're all playing. You know what I mean? And like it's just one piece. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if you, can, if you can solve at least that one piece, it just makes everything else so much easier. Yeah, but I don't like what it does to people. That's what I – that's basically why I put it is uh, they say money's is of evil. And everybody I've met that <coughs> was born into money usually are assholes. Now is Generally. that now is that the money or is that just poor character? You know what I mean? I because don't know. Like, I've seen people that were poor and got money, and they turned into a completely opposite person too. Now were they a good person in the beginning? Yes, and that's what the weird part is. I've I've I have somebody to think about. It. As a matter of fact, uh, that we helped them out a lot, and they um they got money, and uh, they turned into a completely opposite person. And we're, and I think it's also who they connect with once they get the money mm-hmm. that ends up changing their resolve as a person yeah. to turn them into something else. Because hmm. you got to remember that once you get money, there's other, everybody's wanting the money and trying to figure out ways to get the money. Mm-hmm. So they're going to change your whole perspective on life and pe- people that they think you, you were, that are your friends, they're going to make them look like they're not your friends. And I see that a lot in life. Uh, cause especially where I work, I see people that didn't have money and then start getting money and they just change as people. So I, I always hated money. Yeah. And you, you can say to yourself, I don't think I would never change if I got money, but you really don't know that until you're at it. I've had money and, um, uh, it didn't change me, but I've seen it change other people. Yeah. Now, is it changing people, or is it just revealing more of who they really are, I can't like s- who they really who they really want to be, but they just weren't able to? You know I th- what I mean? Because yeah, but I think of the way, best way to look at it is, are they were they bad people, or were they are they easily persuaded into doing things? Other or they just talked into certain things, or easily convinced to certain things? Because there could be bad, there could be nice people that are easily convinced in doing bad, the easily convinced into thinking that other people hate them. Yeah, or easily convinced into doing certain things with their money that they weren't planning on doing, but easily uh, pliable. Some people are that, and way. I think that's a lot of it because you know you look at people that were weren't bad people and they got money and they were kind of pulled into a life that they weren't planning on being pulled into and being talked into certain things that they weren't talked or you wouldn't think they'd be able to talked into. Yeah, because they're easily pliable into doing things other people want them to do. Yeah, people pleasers. Yeah. Now, is that an issue of money or is that just an issue of like weak will? Character? I think there's both of it. Yeah. I don't think the weak will would have came in if you didn't have the money. Hmm. Um, and the money wouldn't have came in if you didn't have a weak. And the money would you wouldn't have spent the money the way you would if you wouldn't have had a weak will. So it's cause and effect there. Hmm. It's it's a big thing. As I've seen it a lot. I mean, I've known very rich people. I've known very poor people that came rich and very rich people that came poor. And I've always noticed that people that went rich that became poor always became better people. And the people that became poor to became rich always turned worse people. Hmm. So I've always been a person that just, I just hated money, which my wife despises because <laughs> yeah because i'll i'll think when I, you only get to have so much money and you spend it while you spend it and have fun while you can and she's like well we need to save for this i'm like yeah it makes sense and probably should save for kids college but <laughs> <laughs> fucking college dude yeah yeah i don't know i i have a little bit a differing view on that because i think that um I think there's a lot of things that can go into a person. I'm not sure if money is the the ultimate kind of factor that's going to reveal those things because some people, you get a lot of money, you can do a lot of fucking good with money. Yeah. You, can, you know, you help a lot of fucking people. You know what I mean? Did you ever get the money though, if you did? What? Did you ever get the money if you went and helped uh, people right off the bat? Like we were talking about um, Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury earlier. Tyson Fury donated his entire mm-hmm. check right to the homeless. 
Yeah. He couldn't that's, do that if he was poor, though. Well, he didn't get the money. He never had access. He, he said he was going to do it. He never got the money. He donated the check. So he never had access to the money where it would have changed him. Now you got to look at it that way. That's an interesting perspective. I mean, but it was still his money to give. Like we know Deontay Wilder. We know uh, Tyson, Tyson Fury's had uh, – he's had some – he didn't grow up rich. He's had a uh, – supposedly he's been busted for drink – like doing – Right. Illicit drugs and drinking and stuff and partying so much, which I believe all of it. Being a pikey growing up, yeah, he uh, probably did all that. But he's how old is he? He or how many fights has he had? Like twenty seven? I don't even know. So he's like twenty seven, twenty eight, no, or something like yeah. that. And this isn't his big, first big fight. I guarantee you, he already has money in his bank account. Yeah, probably. But he, how much is he given to the gypsy community that he's working with? Who knows? There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I always like the guy. So here's a so okay. Here's a point then because. I think I think um, so. He only needs so much money to mm-hmm. to live, right? So he's not like hoarding his money, mm-hmm. right? He like he has enough to live and to do what he wants to do in life. So essentially, he's already solved that money game, and now any extra, he's just helping people with. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. But so you know what I mean? Like it didn't turn. So the he still has well, access to that money, it, but it didn't turn him to a bad know, person. We don't know if it turned him because he had to go to rehab and stuff for when he became a cocaine addiction. Is what I read in the, in the news. Yeah, I'm not saying he had or had, but I, was, mm-hmm. I read in the news that he had. Um, you can't have a cocaine addiction unless you had some money to have a cocaine addiction. This is true. It's not it's a like, poor person. It's drug. like you know, it's uh, that's that's pretty expensive. Yeah, and a guy that size, uh, he's going through. If he's had, if he was doing that much a night, where he had to go to rehab, he was probably doing a thousand dollars a night. That's seven thousand a week. Yeah, you only fight so many so many rounds a day, and it, I read that he only got like. Three million or something for this last fight. One of his biggest fights. You got mm-hmm. three million. Uh, but you put that down, and you're probably buying it for your friends too. Like you buy him drinks. He probably fucking went through some money. He probably blew through a lot of money. He, is, blow is the perfect word. Yeah. Probably blow blow through a lot of money. Yeah, 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 man. He was uh so fucking tooting the white. <laughs> and a lot of boxers do. Is what's crazy. <sighs> Whoa. Yeah, man. I don't know. I'm trying to solve the money piece, though. I want to. I just, for me, I know, like, I don't need, like, I want, like, on my vision board, I have $250 million written on there Mm -hmm. because I fucking, I want to go big. But at the end of the day, I really don't give a fuck about the money. I just like the freedom that it buys me to do. Like, and also, like, I feel like you can't give unless you have. Like, I can't give from an empty cup. Like, yeah. if I don't have anything, what the fuck am I going to give you? I can give you my time, but if I also have a lot of money, like, I can probably do more than what I can do with my time. But the way I look at it is I'd rather give it before I had it, if it makes sense. Like, like, the way he did it. Like, he didn't have the money in his bank account. Like, if I were to, like, how much money I donated for my last fight, if I had to write a check for the amount of money that probably was, that would probably been like, oh, my God, another zero, and another zero, another zero. That would hurt my chest to do. But me not seeing the money ever, yeah, it wasn't hard to do at all mm-hmm. because it was just like you felt good about it. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't, I don't know if you'd feel good about it if you had to write a check out saying, hey, $10,000. You might because you physically wrote that check and it's just like, I am doing this. I think it would be a really tough thing to write that check <laughs> in my head. Yeah. And it'd be a really tough thing. I'm writing that check in front of my wife and going, "You really give them that much money to a charity when we have this that amount of money and credit card bill, bills? Yeah. You know, uh, but it never came to my account where I had to write the check. So yeah. I never had to tell my wife I'm writing a check for X amount of dollars. It just never existed. It just never existed. Yeah. It was never It was never something that came to fruition where I had that money. It was something where I got to go, okay, that money went to there, yeah. and that's that. Yeah. And she never had. She never got to argue with me about it. Well, the, the simplest goal that I have is I just want to be able to go to any restaurant and just order whatever I want and not even think about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if you have tastes of restaurants that <laughs> are going to cost more than what you have. It does. Well, that's the thing. Just the option. Like, I just I just love going and checking out place. But let's just say even just like we're just talking here in St. Louis, you go to, I don't know, like a really decent steakhouse, right? Like nothing extravagant, but you're probably going to spend, I don't know, like 40 or 50 bucks on a really good steak. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's not like crazy wealth. You know what I yeah. mean? But it, You could save up for that every once a month, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> save. I want to save up, Danny. I just want to go do it. <laughs> I see. My thing is, uh, I I can cook. 
So yeah. I can out cook most of the guys at these restaurants. That is true, man. You could fucking you could go get a good cut of meat and cook it at home for far cheaper. And usually do it better than oh all the places too. Oh my gosh! Get a good cast iron skillet. Oh, oh get people that, don't, people get that don't, sear. And then you bake it. People don't understand how you make a lot of food. Yeah. I learned how to cook because I was so poor. Dude, I cook all the time. I very rarely go out to eat. Yeah. I, yeah. I learned how to cook because I was poor as shit. Yeah. You had to make freaking extravagant meals with junk. Yeah. So, like, spam. We had spam in the house all the time. <laughs> I could do some shit with spam that people have never seen before. I bet. Yeah, dude. Fucking growing up poor. It'll teach you a lot in life. Mm-hmm. It'll teach you a fucking uh, lot. Growing up poor, you realize race is nothing. You realize money is nothing. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people they mistake um they mistake race issue like they'll call the race issue but it's really just like a class issue like they're they're arguing really over like socioeconomics. It's like, yeah, we're all poor, so we're all dealing with the same shit. Yeah. I think that's where people get confused sometimes. My thing was always uh I mean, racism is alive and well. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. There's racism on every regard. I mean, I work in I work at the east side. I'm white to the Cook's Barbecue in a strip club parking lot and Bob's is a strip club parking lot. On the east side, from the worst time at night to the worst time in the morning. I get racism to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I was like, I have a lot of people that stick up for me and say, listen, it's not, it's not a such a normal white dude. He, look where he's doing. Yeah. He's hustling barbecue in a parking lot. Uh, he's, he's as black as you. I was like, well, it's, it's funny when they say that stuff. I always get a laugh about it. My grandparents are off the boat. From Ireland, mm-hmm. we never had the. They didn't. They didn't have any contact with anybody other than Irish people until they came here. And Irish are considered. Yeah, you know. Yeah, like, there's a lot of uh, synonyms for racism for Irish people, and black people. Yeah, that people don't know unless you look back on it. Yeah, I'm not saying we've had the had a hard upbringing or anything like that, like a lot of people say, which is bullshit. But I mean, we were looked upon as the same in a lot of regards mm-hmm. when Irish people came over because they were hated as well. Mm-hmm. So. I don't. I don't have any racist bone in my body. I love everybody until you give me reason not to like you. So that's the way I look at things, yeah. and uh, that's why people. Right off the bat, you might look at me like, "Why does white dude cooking barbecue in the East Side parking lot when a black dude could cook it better?" I grew up cooking in a North in North County and learned how to cook their barbecue there. Yeah. With black people, that's who taught me. Yeah. I was like, so you're gonna find out right off the bat that I was like, it's not like that. Right. And I'll stand up for anybody that needs to be stood up for, no matter what color you are against what a color you are. Yeah. So now we're getting into a little deeper subject, but I was like, I love everybody. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care what color you are or what race you are, if you're gay, straight, or whatever. If you need to be stood up for and you can't do it for yourself or you're you're outnumbered, I'm on the I'm on the uh, underdog side always. Right. So no matter what. Yeah, I mean, we're all just fucking humans, dude. Um. There's just so many, like, social constructs that are just, like, put into place that, like, create, like, fear-mongering and just, like, try to pit things against each other. And it's just, like, I don't understand. 100% agree with that. I was, like, I've, I grew up dating freaking black girls when I was young. I was, like, I was around all, all kids who were black when I was growing up. I was, like, those are my friends. Those are yeah. still my friends. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, me and you are boys. And, yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where growing, like, working where I work, I get, you get... The, you see the racism on both sides of it, and it's disgusting to me. It really is, and it's a, unfortunate. A lot of that's just is it, well, it is. It's not a lot of it. All of it's taught. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's all fucking taught. And um, I grew up. So I grew up in Jefferson City from mm-hmm. the time I was I don't know, like eleven. But before then, I lived in Potosi, Missouri. Which for mm-hmm. the folks listening, it's a small little town, probably I don't know about an hour south of here, Saint, here in St. Louis. And um, I don't know how many people are there, uh, maybe 2,000? Yeah, small. N- not not very many people. I think there, there's a prison out there, which is what mm-hmm. most people know it for. But me growing up, dude, I grew up, like, it was really weird because I was probably, I was only one of, like, a handful of, like, black people there. And, like, I'm not even that dark, right? Like, yeah. I'm mixed. And uh, And all the other people who are black there are probably, like, related to me. And then, like, sometimes, now, like, whenever I think about it, some no kid ever really cared. You could tell whose parents were and weren't racist because sometimes kids would say some stupid shit. But, like, when you're a kid, like, unless you unless you know, like, you don't know that that's bad. Like, you don't know, like, how that's supposed to make you feel. Like, you can tell, like, a kid's trying to be mean to you, but you don't necessarily know how that's going to, like, 
You know what I mean? Like, I can remember sometimes some kids saying some shit, and, um, like, I just didn't think twice about it until, like, I started learning more, and then I learned how it made me feel. And, like, one of the the big things was we had this dude in town. His, uh, I don't know his name, but he was in the KKK. And it's funny, like, perspective, because, like, now, as, like, an adult, I'm just like, this is just, like, this short, fat, like, hillbilly guy who lives in a trailer in the fucking woods and, like, probably just dumb as a box of fucking rocks. You know what I mean? But, like, at that time as a kid, I'm like, that's a fucking grown man. He scared the shit out of me, dude. And, like, he always had, like, uh, one time I can remember a couple times. Well, one time he drove well he drove around this, this truck, and there's, like, this little main street through the town, which was, um, you, had, you had to go buy it for me to go home. And um, there's this bench there. And he'd always be parked out there. And, like, in the back of his truck, a little red pickup truck, like, I don't know, a Chevy S10 or some shit. One time in the back of it, he had this coffin, like, this wooden coffin he put back there. And he had this sign that said, niggers should be in here, not veterans or something like that. And then this other time he had um, he had some rig set up with a noose and, like, a dummy hanging, like, a black person hanging. So, like, dude, like, I can remember, like, being a kid and, like, sometimes, like, going to sleep, like, being scared, like, knowing that that guy was out there. And then, like, just, like, <laughs> seeing that, like, as an adult, like, I look back on that and was like, dude, that's just, like, a lot of uh, just poor education and fear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, like, fucked up. Like, that's not something that's actually – in us as humans, I don't feel. No, I mean, people... I think people fear what they don't understand. <laughs> yeah. That's true, but, like, as, like, a kid, like, kids don't see color in that regard, and you know what I mean? And then, like, start, like, I don't like you because of your color. Yeah. Uh, my daughter, like, I, I dealt with this crap on both sides because when I moved from, like, North County to Lake St. Louis, you have a North County accent. I always have my North County accent. I can go to my and fucking Irish accent too, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I had a North County accent, um, and it was uh, it, you know I would in North County you're the white kid, and when you move to the white area, you're like the hillbilly Winsville area, you're the the ghetto kid, yeah. And it was one of those things where I was always the outcast, yeah. And I never had a problem with it. Is what was funny. I never never bothered me so much, but I didn't have it to the extent you had it. But um, my daughter when. She, when she was growing up, she was in Ferguson Florissant School District. She was the only white kid in her class. So she... Uh, That's got to be rough. Oh, it was. And it was one of the reasons I moved <laughs> out of Ferguson Florissant because I love North County. Mm-hmm. I, I love North County to the day I die. Um, she'd be started going and think, thinking that everybody of color was mean because yeah. all the kids in her class where she was the only white kid, they were screwing with her. And she'd get in fights because I taught her how to fight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had to move out of there as soon as, I, as soon as I sensed that she might start becoming something that I never wanted her to become or something I wasn't or something my wife wasn't. Yeah. Because it was just – it was ingrained in her and it wasn't taught. Yeah. It was ingrained because that was the experience she had. Yeah. So I moved, her, I moved the hell out of there. Like got rid of my house that I was working to own and uh, went from having a place to stay – Big ass house, and uh, it was in Calverton Park. Big ass house there, and uh, I didn't want my daughter to become racist at all. Yeah, because I'm not from that from that bad experience. Yeah, and she she was getting a bad experience in that school district because she was, and it wasn't these kids' fault. I don't think it was taught like we were saying as much as it was. She was different, and I think the fact that she was the different kid. She was blonde hair, blue eyed, pigtail girl. And all the rest of the kids weren't. Yeah, once you do get to a certain age, like, kids do become assholes. I, yeah. think, I think it's important to keep in context, like, the ages. Yeah. Because, like, wh- when I say kids, I'm thinking, like, real, real young kids, yeah, right? Yeah, she, like, was, she, was she was in kindergarten. Yeah, so. yeah. So, like, once you start getting into, like, that uh, like that six, seven, eight-year-old range, you start, mm-hmm. like, realizing the differences in people. And some kids really start attacking those. Yeah. yeah. And I would actually like – because I think I made it sound like I experienced a whole lot of hate – now that that guy, yeah, but like for the most part, like all the kids were were like great. Like I can just thinking back in hindsight, some kids saying some things, and then um, like my whole family, like I was my mom's white, and I was basically raised by like that whole side of the family. Um, so like I mean, I I never like 
thought like all white people were bad. Yeah. But I could definitely see how. I mean, you see that with kids all the time, right? Like. And she wasn't. She wasn't mixed. Is the thing is, she didn't have the. I would actually have um, black friends come over and trying to introduce my daughter and be like, hey, this is one of dad's friends. And she was starting to get that feeling of he's black, kind of be wary of him because of what she was dealing with. And yeah. I was like, man, I can't, I can't have this in her because I never had this. Uh, I never felt this. And I don't want this to be instilled in her at all. Yeah. So we moved the hell out of North County to actually move from there to uh, move from there to freaking West County. And I mean, I left, <laughs> lost a shit ton of money doing it, yeah. but I couldn't have that in my daughter. Again, money doesn't mean shit to me. Yeah. I'd rather have my daughter not be that person that I thought that that was where she was going to become. Yeah. And it, she may not ever have, she may have grown out of it and been like, screw that. No, I'm, I was wrong when I was younger, but I was so scared of her being something that I never believed in, never saw, never wanted. I was so scared of that. That was my thing. My kids are my world and I didn't want them to be. I, I I try and stay in the same position, same, because moving around so much screwed me up as a kid. I'm trying to stay in the same like area and same school district for my daughter and my son, yeah. so they don't move to. I went to like ten different high schools. <laughs> you know? Yeah, dude, I understand. I um I really like the school district that the, my kids are in now. It's um yeah, it's just a really good school district. There's a lot of diversity and mm-hmm. there's uh just the, tons of great programs. So honestly, you moved into a definitely probably better pro- like school district anyway. Oh, yeah. We moved from Ferguson Florissant to um, Rockwood, from Rockwood to uh, Wentzville. Wentzville is phenomenal. That's a great school district Like, they there. do really good for my daughter. Nice. And uh, my, son's get, my son's getting ready to be in kindergarten next year. And yeah. he's going to be uh, – he's going to move into – he's in a better school district than Ferguson Florissant. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I kind of wanted my kids to have that diversity – but that's just a shit. Like, yeah, it's, it's not, when they quit sending home homework to these kids, and I yeah. think it's they. We would have my daughter turn in homework, and they quit sending home homework to her in kindergarten. And they said, "Well, the other kids weren't doing it." And I said, "I don't give a shit." Yeah. So it was one. Of the, they lost accreditation when we were there, and a lot of stuff. Yeah, that school district's taking yeah. a hard hit. They're not doing so hot. No. Well, yeah, this was before the uh, all the stuff happened over in Ferguson. Yeah. This is before all that stuff happened. Mm. So she was there before and it was just going downhill from there yeah well you left at a good time yeah we left like right before now it'd been a lot easier to sell while it was going on because i could have just been like made like burn this home down (laughs) (laughs) as opposed to me paying all this money for (laughs) that's funny dude but um you know it's one of those things it was uh like i'm the i'm the nicest guy on the planet yeah uh, until you push me and then i'm the meanest guy on the planet but i don't care what ethnicity you're brought up in or anything like that yeah and i don't i want my daughter to be like open to everybody yeah like hey you can talk to anybody you want i don't care who you date i don't care what you do just don't screw up yeah you know and it's one of those things where i hopefully she kind of goes up the way i did in that regard screw up small (laughs) yeah screw up small and small small areas (laughs) don't screw up big yeah because i never screwed up big yeah i was like that was my thing i never screwed up big in my entire life yeah. I screwed up small a lot of times. Yeah, dude. I mean, you're going to fail and fail often, but just do it on a small scale. You, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, in the sense of, like, don't do it. I heard, um, I don't know if I was listening. I don't know if I was listening to something, or I think I was, but somebody said uh, it's better to uh, want something you don't have than to have something you don't want. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know exactly. What I mean? Like, fuck, dude. Like, I... And then that comes with the old saying of, uh, what was it? One of the uh, great actors said, it was like, uh, I'd rather uh, learning growing up Catholic. I learned to uh, it's better to ask Jesus for forgiveness than than ask for something you don't want or something like that. Oh uh, yeah, or well, it's better to ask for uh, forgiveness than it is you know permission. Yeah, permission. Uh, <laughs> still, still the bike and uh, ask for forgiveness than to <laughs> ask for permission to steal the bike. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of the same way to look at it as I'd rather have uh, I'd rather be able to have get get something and keep it than ask for, than try and want it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't you definitely don't want to ask for permission to go out and get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh go go make whatever it is happen that you're trying to happen. And um I, I usually extrapolate that to like just how I want to live my life. Like I'm just trying to sure. build the life that I wanna live, you know what I mean? And I think um, you know, money not being important kinda does tie into that because if you're so tied into like making this X amount of dollar, like that'll keep you like trapped. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Live to your means and uh, be content with what they got. That's a big thing I've always been good at is being content with what I got. Yeah. 
So like I wrecked my car and uh, I was getting ready to buy a new car and I thought, you know what, my wife works her ass off. I'll buy her a new car instead and I'll take her old car that she doesn't want anymore. So and that's what I did. As I did that, I was like, "Now don't get me wrong. I'm not thrilled with the car I have. It's not my my dream car." I was like, "But she's happy with the Lincoln she has, and I'm driving around the car that I never wanted." <laughs> yeah, it works. But it, she's happy, and it's easier to be. If she's happy, it's easier to be happy mm-hmm. than it is to be like, "I wish I had what she had." It makes sense. Yeah. She's happier. Happy wife, happy home. Yeah, I guess the best way to put it. Yeah. If she's happier, then it's it comes back to me where she's not coming home pissed off all the time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> hey man, you gotta pick your fucking battles. Yeah. You know it's and important. I'm very I'm I'm cool with I'm cool with having my battles of my wife's okay to make out with me and have fun with me. <laughs> <laughs> Living the good life. Because that's Annie. that's the that's the dream is having a wife that's happy. <laughs> that's for sure, dude. It makes everything else a whole lot easier. Um when whoever uh I guess your life partner is is fucking happy. Sure. Yeah. Good shit, Danny. Well, bro, we uh about an hour and a half in, dude. It's Dang. awesome. Well, dude, let's wrap this up. Yes, sir. It's been a great conversation. Um, the floor is yours. Is there anything you want to plug, talk about sponsors, um, uh, socials, if people want to get a hold of you? Whatever, crap. Whatever. If, you, if you like my tattoos, go to Diablo Inc. And uh, go to Wolves Den MMA for we want to come and hear more crazy stories from me. Um, and I work at Diamond Cabaret on the east side if you like to come and have some food. And see if I'm as good as I talked. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. All right, Dan, I appreciate it, brother. No problem, brother. All right, everyone. Glad I was here.